the apple Newton picked up and ate is nowhere close to the same apple he would have seen today. Today's fruits and vegetables are unnaturally colored, laced with pesticides, and made through unsustainable practices. Newton would have probably chucked the apple at John Locke, looking at the amount of unsustainability that goes into food production, making him question the current food systems. Food systems are those systems that have activities such as production, um, disposal, uh, consumption, processing, etc. The current state of food systems in India is alarming, owing to the depleting natural resources and changing consumer patterns. Today, we will be looking at food system of India and the world. The sustainable practices that can be used to ensure overall development. Delving deep into certain areas in India, value chains and talking about India's bright future and sustainability. And to help us with that, we have here with us Mr. Nabajoti Deka. Mr. Deka is an agribusiness economist with a passion for sustainability in food system and value chains, amongst others. He is currently a faculty member at the prestigious FMS Delhi University with a research interest in the sustainability of agri-food system. Sir, we are honored to have you here with us today. How are you doing this fine evening? Thank you, Chaitanya and Tashneem for having me for the podcast. I'm really glad that you have made me a part of your economics conference. Um, yeah, I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you. We are glad to have you here today, sir. Thank you so much Thank you, Thank you. for accepting Thank you. our offer. Uh, sir, so for the benefit of the viewers and listeners, can you tell us a bit about what constitutes as agricultural value chains? Oh, well, so see, the idea of value chain is not new. And in, in the world of economics and business management, we often come across the term value chain, right? Uh, to put it in a very simple terms, whatever products, the goods we use, it passes through a series of value addition activities, right? And eventually it, it, uh, it transforms the inputs to an output, which we consume, right? For example, steel, iron ore, right? Leads to uh, steel, then automobile grade steel, then it is uh, used for manufacturing automobiles, right? So in a similar manner, when it comes to agriculture value chain, so all the agricultural commodities, the food, the fruits, or the juice, which we consume, the food products, it passes through a series of activities. So this, this includes a production, where we talk about the farmer, taking care of the production, inputs, how much, how much ke chemicals to use, certain good, which then goes for processing. Then it goes for say, marketing, branding, and retailing. For example, a farmer produces potatoes, right? And this potatoes, which goes to uh, maybe a factory, which is processed to uh, uh, manufacture chips, which we consume, say frito lays or uncle chips, right? So this series of activities is what constitutes the value chain. Um, in your study on the value chain development of tea cultivators in Assam, what were your findings on how to make the value chain sustainable and inclusive? Yeah, fine. So uh, when it comes to value chain of tea, so bef even before I uh, give you details about the tea value chain, so let me give you a brief context to the tea industry, how it works. Tea industry is perhaps one of the oldest industry in India. Uh, and since, uh, I mean, since uh, the British... East India Company came, they established tea plantations, right, in 1830s and 40s. And uh, and this this eventually led to uh, the tea industry in Assam and Darjeeling, right? Now, in in last 170, 180 years, the tea industry has been controlled by the industrialists or the corporates or the wealthy people. It was in 1970s and 80s when the small farmers, the individual farmers were also encouraged to cultivate tea, right? So tea, which is produced, say, in a plantation, tea plantation, we get green tea leaves, the raw raw green tea leaves, which goes for processing. It, it passes through a series of activities, right? So weathering, maceration, oxidation, right? And we get the final finished tea product. Now, the problem with the existing tea industry is that most of the value chain, the tea value chain is controlled by the industries, the corporates, right? The small scale farmers, they have a very limited role uh, in the tea value chain. So my research starts at the point where the small scale farmers who 
who say, supplies 50% of the green raw leaves to the industry, but their income from tea cultivation is minimum, meager. So this is where my research starts on the tea value chain. Rather, I would say the alternative tea value chain, which is an outcome of adoption of organic cultivation by tea farmers, right? So yes, when it comes to tea value chain, uh, you have, there, there is a series of activities that transforms raw green tea leaves to the tea that we consume. But then there are many stakeholders involved in this tea value chain. Of course, as you said, uh, there are, uh, there are diff different examples which farmers use to, to say, uh, kill the pest or maybe distract the pest. One such, exa one such example could be similar, fine, solar trap, solar traps for the insects or pest, fine. There could be blue sticky, they, they place this blue sticky small, small boards, which attracts sudden pest, fine. And uh, and I have seen when I was, uh, uh, say, doing my field work in Assam and even in mountains, I have seen farmers, they will use some, uh, some, some sort of yellow strip, right? Okay. And they will put it in a plant or in a big tree, so all the insects will get attracted to that particular strip, right? And this helps them to some extent to get rid of the pest or the insects which attack their crops. Yeah, I I hope I could find. Yes, sir. So mm -hmm. so so I wanted to ask you a follow up uh, regarding this uh, answer that you gave. You were talking about this yellow strip they they placed around the trees yeah. and the uh, big crops. So so was yeah. this an age old idea or was this introduced by? Uh, parties with modern technology. Okay. So these oh. are traditional ways of, say, pest controlling, mm -hmm. which the farmers have been practicing uh, since many years, many generations. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, this pestis, organic pesticide that you mentioned, it, it is completely good for the soil? Yes. So, yeah. Mm, when it comes to, uh, say, uh, ginger, using ginger, garlic, and green chili paste with cow urine, right? Okay. It is a, it is, it's completely organic or natural input for the farm, right? Okay. So uh, the farmers, the organic farmers, the farmers who are doing natural farming, right? They often, they, they rely on inputs which are naturally available, mm -hmm. which doesn't have any synthetic uh, input or any chemical uh, chemical content in that, right? Which might kill the overall purpose of doing organic farming or natural farming, right? So it's it's more about the philosophy behind the production system we're talking about, be it organic farming, be it natural farming, right? The idea is to create an ecosystem, right? Um, of interconnected components, right? Right from the soil micro, micro, I mean, I'm talking about the microbes present in the soil, to the crops grown, to the entire uh, ecosystem created by the farmer based on his knowledge, right? So it is more about managing the farm in a very natural environment. Okay, yes. Sir. Okay, 166 mega metric tons of deficit of food storage is reported. And according to a study, 18% of all fruits and vegetables get wasted because of food storage and cold storage issues. Why do you think these pitfalls persist and what are the potential solutions to these problems? So uh, see, uh, first of all, if, if, I mean, if we consider India, the agriculture sector in India, it's very, very large, it's very vast, right? And we have millions of farmers and uh, these farmers, they grow, they grow multiple crops fruits, vegetables, right? So what is necessary? I mean, from, from the, say, the demand side, right? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily that information reaches to the farmer at the right time when he's think, planning for his production, right? Correct. At the same time, the, the quantity that he needs to produce, right? So there is an information asymmetry that plays that plays a role here. That that is a factor. Another thing is due to the fluctuating nature of prices in the market, right? Okay. The farmer um, doesn't have enough information of the price, 
So hmm. when he was producing the crop, he had certain price in mind. By the time his produce is ready to be sold in the market, the price either goes up or goes down, right? Yeah. And there have been several occasions where the price has gone down drastically. You must you must have heard about uh, a few years back. I read news articles where farmers in Andhra Pradesh they had to throw throw away uh, say tons of tomatoes in the road, right? Okay. Why? Because the price of tomatoes plummeted to one or two rupees per kg. So can you imagine? So the yes. farmer has a price in his mind. He goes to the market, right? Then he 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 realized the price of the tomatoes has has just been I mean, it's unreasonably low, right? So yes. he rather choose to throw his produce. The same is the case with the tea farmers with whom I spoke to, right? So many tea farmers, tea producers, they go with a, a mindset, okay, fine. I have produced this many cases of green tea leaves, fine. So when he reaches the factory, right, for some reason, but different factors comes into play here. But again, the, the problem is same, right? Yeah. The price of tea leaves, which he's expecting and which he goes on. So they have to throw it away. So that is one. The next reason for wastage of fruits and vegetables, especially perishable food products, mm. is the inefficiencies in the supply chain. Okay. We have made considerable progress when it comes to improving the cold storage facilities in India, but we still have a long way to go when it comes to reducing the waste is from say about 20%, 25% to bring it down to 5% or even why 5%, why not one or 2% or make right. it negligible, right? So perhaps this is where uh, technological innovation and, and startups, right, which are keen to solve this problem can, can play a pivotal role. I'll just cite one example. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, see, farmers, right, when they produce, they 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 must increase the self life of the food products or the crops they produce, right? Okay. So most of the perishable products, I mean, will perish in say two or three or four days, right? Mm. But it may just think if this self life can be enhanced by a few more days, right? Correct. Fine. They can they can realize the sales, right? Correct. And hence yeah. better income, but. We don't have enough cold storage facilities in the rural areas. That is why they have to either sell it at a low price or throw it away, as I have explained. Yeah, 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 yeah of course. Example. But then there, there are startups like EcoFrost, which have okay. used solar energy to develop mobile cold storage vents, right? And this mobile vents goes to villages that charge a minimal fee from the farmers and help the farmers in, in, in increase the self life of the the produce. Right? Correct. Right. So this helps yes, them to increase their yeah. income. Profitability. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay. So 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 the question I would like to ask you is that on 31st May, the Union Cabinet approved a rupee one lakh crore program yes. to create the world's largest grain storage capacity which promises an additional 700 lakh tons mm. uh, capacity in the cooperative sector to right. reduce crop damages and prevent distress sales, as you mentioned, by farmers mm. and strengthen food, food security. Mm. This exemplifies the importance of the cooperative sector. How do moves like these by the government encourage and incentivize agribusinesses? This recent move by the government of India is a remarkable move. First, this will ensure stories of food, right? Uh, without the farmers having to uh, be concerned about the price fluctuation Correct. in the market. Mm -hmm. Next is this also ensures uh, throughout the year stories of food grains, right? Okay. To meet the food security needs of the country. Now, okay. this, this, move, uh, this move is also um, a very, a very uh, strong initiative in the direction of the national food security mission right. right and when it comes to the cooperative sector the cooperative sector has been uh, to a significant extent the backbone of rural economy right. india had many cooperative societies right mm. um, but unfortunately the cooperative model has not been very successful 
in in giving the results uh, for which it was intended to right Correct. and this is this is one reason why, why we have uh, recently the farmer producers organizations and and we have the farmer producer companies which is mm. in a way trying to uh, trying to redefine the way farmers forms their collectives oh. Uh, okay. When when we talk about this enhanced storage capa capacity, uh, storage facility for grains, one significant change when it comes to agribusinesses, which I see is that this farmer producer organizations, which hmm. right some of these FPOs or farmer producer organizations, they were actually transformed from these cooperative societies, right? And okay. many of the farmer producer companies, which are uh, supposed to or which are in fact uh, promoted to behave as business entities right they can they can take advantage of this kind of uh, storage facilities mm. now so uh, when it comes to the storage facilities so i was talking about the farmer producer organizations Correct. right yes the collective which, which and then uh, I was also talking with the farmer producer companies, right? right? So this this new new way of organizing the farmers for collective mm -hmm. action, right? Right from production to marketing, right? Is is to do away with the disadvantages of the traditional cooperative societies we had, right? Okay. Now when this comes to the the storage facility, right? This farmer producer companies can can be integrated with the PSCS, the primary agricultural credit societies. Ah, this, yeah, PSCS, yeah. this PSCS, uh, they are grassroots level institutions, organizations, right? With already millions of farmers being a part of it. So traditionally they were involved in grading, uh, providing short-term credits to the farmers. Right. Correct. So the farmers have many short-term credit requirement, right? So the PCS they they were primarily responsible for giving short-term credits to the farmers to meet their requirements. Now, recently, uh, Nabard it mm. has has uh, has uh, started working in this direction. It, Nabard wants the PCS to also get involved in additional services, which mm also includes which also includes information uh, right uh, so providing information to the farmers yeah. helping the farmers to uh, start small scale agri businesses yeah. right including processing grading all those value chain activities right, right. right. so right. When, when we see the storage facilities this first of all it allows decentralized way of storing grains at the local level right mm. Now, this, this cooperatives, which can be transformed to the FPCs or FPOs, right? They can involve in value addition activities because they, they, they can be integrated with the PSES. They have uh, access to the grains, storage facilities. Yeah. Out, and then these entities are supposed to behave like bus uh, business entities, right? So they Correct. can involve in no more value addition activities or value chain activities. So I, I see this whole interconnection as a win-win for the farmers, for the FPOs, for the PSCS, yeah. right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you spoke about globalization, but in the recent time during COVID, we saw disrupted global trade and supply chain and witnessed a shift to deglobalization. Right. What is the current state of value chain taking the COVID into consideration? Uh, we have immensely benefited from globalization, as yeah. I have mentioned, right? Uh, globalization has uh, made many products available to us, right? Mm. We can't even imagine, right? And with globalization comes centralized and uh, commercialized way of producing things. So what we have right now in the agribusiness sector is, I would say, a corporate regime of food production. Right, right. Mm. Highly standardized, highly globalized. Wow. At least in in certain certain crops, or at least in um, this is true for certain products, food products. Right. Yeah. Now, because of this, 
there's a changing trend in the way we consume food, right? So maybe 25, 30 years back, we were not very keen to have a burger or a pizza, right? Mm -hmm. Or things that we often consume uh, when we just go out in the market, right? So many of these food commodities, right, are a product of the standardized, centralized way of producing food, right? Now, because of this, th see, this has a very uh, long-term impact on the farmers as well. Because there's, there is huge demand for a burger, right, or say, the, uh, right, so there will be proportionately, right? Yeah. yeah. Proportionate uh, extent of demand for the grains, cereals, which is used to produce those food commodities, food products. Right. Yeah. This means the the farmers are also expected to produce that particular grain or yeah. that cereal or that particular crop, right? right. Fine. Fine. So yeah. this has also connection to the green revolution. Because during green revolution, oh. it's 1970s and 80s, right? There's too much focus on selected few varieties of cereals. Fine. Now, at this point in time, when I see, say, uh, what are the disadvantages of the green revolution? Of course, there are several disadvantages of green revolution. But when we see the disadvantages, perhaps this is one of this, right? So farmers in different regions focused on single variety of crops. That is one. Next is because of the globalization, say post-economic liberalization, we had many corporates find uh, foreign into agribusiness in India, and then we have standardized and centralized uh, production of crop. Fine. So we have a globalized value chain. But at this point in time, the the biggest concern right now is not food security. It's not do we have enough food. It's mm. it's more about the nutrition security. Are we eating a healthy diet, right? So okay. we have moved beyond the idea of food security. Fine. See, we we have we have produced enough food, right? We have more than enough. But the, the question here, the concern here is, is it healthy for everyone? And that is why that is why the, the gradual shift towards crops like millet, right? Traditionally, millet has been has been known as uh, a crop which is rich in nutrients, right? So there's a, there's, a very, there's a very strong interlinkage between a lot of things that I have mentioned, right? Perhaps, yeah. so because there are so many disadvantages of the globalized and standardized uh, nature of the food system that we are a part of today, which we have realized during the COVID times, which was disrupted, right? The global food supply chain was disrupted. And that is when people started looking for the local food supply chain, right? Correct. So and then, and then, how to make the local food system resilient? How to strengthen the existing food system? See, traditionally we already have this local food system. Say, if you go to villages, right? So I'm from Assam. So we already okay. have the villages cluster of villages, right? Having a small weekly market, maybe every Sunday and Thursday, where the farmers sell their local produce, right? So we already have this market, this local food system, right? Where farmers decide what to produce, how much to produce, right? But perhaps we need to reconsider this structure, right? Make it more resilient so that the lessons that we have learned during the, during the COVID times, right? That yes, globalized food system, global value chain has done several good things for us, right? At the same time, it has also its shortcomings. Right, for which it needs to be supported right, with the help of the local or alternative food systems. We can already see this trend happening uh, in in the developed nations. Right, if you uh, talk, you if you uh, take the case of Europe, if you take the case of Japan, if you take the case of Canada, right, local food systems or alternative food systems where the farmers can directly reach out to the consumers. Right, the consumers decide. Okay. We want so and so and so crops and vegetables, and accordingly, the farmer decides to produce exact the same products, the quantity at which it is demanded, right? So, this direct connection of the producer and the consumer, fine. So, mm -hmm. this is what is the cost of local food system, right? Uh, so, sir, what is the cost of this organic farming? Because 
farmers also have to pay a higher price to get these materials so like what is the a threshold kind of after which organic farming can be profitable or is there anything like that uh yeah this is a very tricky part for me to answer tricky because uh it's very contextual right okay. so in fact uh, one of my research article based on my phd the whole research article is only about this is organic cultivation of tea right mm. profitable for farmers or not Correct. Right. Assuming that he didn't process tea, assuming that the tea I was talking about in the very beginning of this uh, this conversation, right? The farmer is confined to just production of raw green tea leaves, right? Yeah. Now, if he produces it organically or inorganically, which is more profitable, right? Mm. And when I was exploring this, it it eventually led me to several perspectives and then I realize there are multiple factors that interplays to decide whether organic farming can be profitable or not right it it, it depends say for example see uh, organic farming the cost of organic farming right is yeah. most because of the labor requirement input cost of labor right which may range from 1.5 to two times compared to traditional okay. method of farming, right? Yeah. But then the trade-off is, in organic farming, the organic farmer is not paying for the chemical inputs, right? So more or less, it's balanced, fine. But then it doesn't mean that it will lead to, it, it will essentially lead to profit for the farmer, right? Say, and the, there's a farmer who is not experienced enough to uh, to use the farm management practices or the organic farming principles, right? So Correct. just because he doesn't have enough knowledge on how to do it, or just because he doesn't have enough experience, right, on on how to use the best farm management practices, he may not be able to achieve that yield level, which will give him the profit, right? But there are farmers who are experienced enough; they knows, right? how to use this principles right how to use the guidelines in in, in such right. a way so that he achieved that yield level which will fetch him right reasonable income or profit out of it right so that is one part the nature of the soil is another story right mm -hmm. where the farmer is located what kind of uh, say uh, ecosystem this the, this whole you know ecosystem he is taking care of fine yeah. whether the inputs organic inputs he's taking is it locally sourced is he buying anything from outside right so there are multiple factors that interplay but it's quite contextual right it only depends on how these factors interplay to uh yeah maybe. So can we say we are going reverse green revolution especially in the areas that you have done your research in like a farm in the spin ball uh, yes. Okay. Fine. Uh, see, green revolution was even though we say green revolution was pan India, it was actually not. It was confined to few states, right? Punjab, Haryana, UP, and maybe uh, parts of Andhra Pradesh, right? And but uh, the entire nation was benefited from uh, the scientific revolution that happened due to green revolution, right? Mm. Right. Now, when it comes to say organic farming or not just organic farming, adoption of sustainable production methods, right? Correct. Fine. Sustainable farming practices in India. So, uh, as you said, are we going back? Perhaps yes. Perhaps there's a realization that because of green revolution, right? We have also to a significant extent deteriorated the soil health at least in those regions, right? And this is why uh, since uh, a decade or so, the government, the policy makers, they have been insisting a lot on adoption of sustainable farming practices. Now, the biggest question when it comes to adopting sustainable farming practices, right? It is suitable in those regions where traditionally, right? It was not a part of green revolution. For example, Northeast India, right? Or, or you say Sikkim, or you say the 
the the states uh, in northern himalayan region himachal pradesh uttarakhand or jammu and kashmir right or you can also talk about the interior regions of jharkhand or madhya pradesh right there are many tribal belts right where people were not influenced by the green revolution right they have been pretty uh, more or less practicing traditional way of farming so so these are the reasons which the government is targeting right now one example is the mission organic value chain development for northeast india right okay and you and you, uh, you must have heard about uh, uh, the first organic state in india is sikkim mm. right yeah. one of the reasons why sikkim could achieve that is traditionally the use of pesticides and chemicals has been very low right mm. but can we do the same thing in uh, in a village in punjab which has extensively used chemical pesticides or which has explo i mean exploited ground level to an extent where it is not easily available it's a big question mark right i cannot i won't say no but yes it will be far more challenging to bring those changes when it comes to sustainable production in yes. those regions right then compared to those which was not touched okay okay yes so so now moving on to an other uh, type of question uh, mm -hmm. uh, you have also conducted research in societies and agri societies right so um, uh, as uh, just to give the viewers some context a society can be categorized as collective or individualistic based on their tendencies to share uh, yeah right sir and uh, most notably uh, this comparison is made in uh, northern and southern china which is divided by the yangtze river and um, where Uh, if northern china uh, chooses to be collective or individualistic the crop patterns and the uh, resource allocation changes in southern china depending on the type of crop or rice or wheat, uh, wheat that require different types of resources inputted for their usage so uh, yeah so now coming to india a uh, recent study showed that how a society based uh, is based on whether it is collective or individualistic and it has produced either rice or wheat so um, yeah so do you think the same applies to assam and west bengal all right all right so yeah so the the uh, the idea here is uh, whether agriculture or agricultural production or we say uh, say agri businesses right should be done collectively or individually isn't it right? yeah so let let me uh, give a context to what happened in china right so in 1960s and 70s China was still uh, a socialist, socialist nation, right? Correct. And the way agriculture was practiced, it was the socialist way, or I would say the community owned the resources. But in nineteen seventy eight, right, nineteen seventy eight, and and then in early nineteen eighties, right. So this model, this socialist model of doing agriculture, uh, was changed to individualistic, right? The individual way of uh food production right now that in that uh, point in time or when we go back to uh, the case of china in 1960s and 70s and 80s right the situations were quite different right but it but it 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 paid off china immensely and it brought a revolution in the chinese agriculture landscape right now in today's context when we say uh when we talk about collectivizing the farmers through co maybe cooperative societies or uh, in the recent times the farmer producer organizations or the farmer producer companies right in today's context when it is a market economy right we are are we are talking about collectivizing the farmers to benefit from the economies of scale there is a limit there is a limit to which an individual producer so it could be any producer right so when it comes to farmers and agricultural producer uh, there is a limit to which an individual farmer can benefit right or or i would say an individual farmer can enhance or increase in his income by producing certain crops right so there needs to be some mechanism through which uh, more farmers needs to be organized collectively which in right which helps them to coordinate collaborate and if there is, if there is synergy right yes. so this will bring the economies of scale so this exactly is the idea of individualistic way of doing things versus 
the collectivist way, right? So when we talk about the farmers' collectives in today's agrarian societies, uh, I feel based on my experience from Assam, uh, West Bengal, and even many successful case studies from other regions of India, collectivizing the farmers is a good idea, and this is the way forward. But of course, because uh, uh, we had many challenges when it comes to the cooperative societies, right? Uh, the, some of those disadvantages will inherently be a part of the farmer producer organizations, right? Which have been transformed from these cooperative societies, right? So the challenge is to how to, first of all, how to uh, get away, right? Or how to make sure that those disadvantages of the cooperative societies is not a part of the FPOs or FPCs anymore, first of all. Next is how this farmer producer organizations or farmer producer com companies, right, needs to be handholded or needs to be supported, right, so that they behave like a business entity. And perhaps this is where the corporates who are already ex like the business entities, the, the industries, right, who already have enough expertise on how to manage things, the business acumen, the entrepreneurial part of it, right? They can handhold these FPCs or FPOs in growing them as business entities, right? And, and, and one more part, which is a very big challenge when it comes to collective action of farmers, is the trust. So when I was speaking to the farmers in West Bengal or in Assam, right? Trust between the members is a very big challenge, which, which is something that needs to be understood at a very uh, grassroots level and how to use those insights from the field, right? To, to, uh, to build a network of farmers who trust each other. So as we come to a close for this episode of How the World Works from the Economist Next Door, I would just like to thank Mr. Navjyoti Deka for his incredible insights into food systems, agri-development and society. I'm sure we all learned a whole lot from today's episode. And uh, Mr. Deka, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with us today? Yeah, first of all, thank you, Chaitanya and Tasneem for having me for the podcast. I'm really glad that you have listened to me, given me the opportunity to share my views on how we can have a more resilient and sustainable food system. Yeah. Right? So, uh, yes, I don't have uh, anything specific, but just a few thoughts to share with you. Sure, sir. So, uh, when we were discussing about the global food system, yeah. and then we talked about the alternative of local food system, right? So one, perhaps one thought that comes to my mind is, uh, we need to support the local farmers, right? Mm. And the farmers who are trying to be local entrepreneurs, right? Okay. So yes, not every farmer can be an entrepreneur, mm. but I, I do believe that there are farmers in and around us who has that spark of starting his own business, right? No matter how small, yeah. and he has that entrepreneurial bent of mind, right? Correct. So perhaps uh, we we can handhold to what to whatever extent possible within our capacity to help those small scale micro entrepreneurs, so that he becomes the role model or mm. uh, a, 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 a leader, a local leader who becomes an influential, uh, say, individual, right? Correct. And eventually he also ends up creating more farmer entrepreneurs like him. Yeah. So just to give an example, when I was, say, I, when I was doing my field work in Assam, yeah. I, I uh, interacted with hundreds of farmers, right? And then there were examples where in one single village, there'll be one tea farmer, one tea grower, right? Yeah. who had the spark of doing something unique, doing something different, right? Then he helped the dog processing. And in the process of doing so, he ended up he ended up inspiring many other farmers to adopt sustainable practices. He ended up inspiring many other farmers to process tea by themselves and become a part of the value chain, right? right. So this is where, this is where, uh, this is where uh, uh, we can play a role. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for that answer, sir. And thank you so much for being here with us today and giving your valuable time to us on this uh, day. Uh, and thank you so much to everyone 
who tuned in for this episode and have a nice day thank you sir thank you sir thank you, thank you. have a nice day